There have been many UFC champions who have cheated. Because John Jones uh, tested positive. Lied. I mean, I use him, it's contaminated. And disgraced the sport. But there is one champion who is arguably the worst of them all. Ah, uh, there's a little snake in the grass right there. TJ was never the best teammate. Would like try to hurt people. That's so, why you call them Killershaw? Yeah, Killershaw, Dillashank. How my face? <laughs> Dillashaw tested positive for injectable EPO. We all knew what he was on. But it wasn't always this way. UFC 173. TJ Dillashaw enters the octagon as a 6 to 1 underdog to face the most dominant force the bantamweight division had ever seen, Renan Barrow, who was on a 32 fight winning streak. But TJ only got here because of his mentor, Uriah Faber. Faber was the owner of Team Alpha Male and had pulled a young TJ Dillashaw out of college, guiding and crafting him into a spectacular MMA practitioner. And although TJ had lost twice in the UFC already, once after making it through the Ultimate Fighter reality TV show, but losing to John Dodson in the final by knockout, and second was a split decision loss to Rafael Asuncao. Faber was confident that his prodigy was good enough to take out the reigning defending champion. This coupled with Team Alpha Male's new head coach Dwayne Ludwig, owner of one of the fastest knockouts in UFC history, who had been elevating the team's striking for the last year, with noticeable improvements. The odd makers saw TJ for what he was though, a college wrestler who couldn't quite make it to the top, and a UFC fighter who struggled to put a meaningful win streak together. And so, as a massive underdog and late replacement, DJ stepped into the octagon. Winning the UFC title is a moment that has been repeated many times, but each and every single strap wrapped around the victor brings with it the same poignant feelings and emotions elicited by the minutia of each individual's fighters' lives, the unique journey to the belt that separates each one from another. TJ was no different, an underdog counted out from the very beginning, a loser too young and too inexperienced, yet he shook the world with his win over Barral. TJ's head coach, Dwayne, crying as he embraces his student. His team and the crowd go crazy. UFC UFC staff all experiencing equal levels of shock and amazement at this crowning moment of a young athlete. Uriah enters the stage to congratulate and hug the high school wrestler he pulled out of college, the kid who had such promise for a career in mixed martial arts. Certainly without Uriah, TJ would never have his name etched into history itself. And whilst TJ rode the thrill of reaching the pinnacle of the sport, the cracks of his friendship were already present and the darkness was about to spew out between the splits. Dwayne Ludwig decided in January to leave his native Colorado and accept a job in Sacramento, California as Team Alpha Male's head coach. Before rivalries, before gym departures, and before a drug cheating scandal to shock the sport, this story starts in Sacramento, California, home to Team Alpha Male, a squad of elite fighters that for a long time had been dominating the lower weight divisions. Members included the likes of Chad Mendes, Joseph Benavides, Clay Guida, and Josh Emmett. For a long time, Uriah Faber served as a head coach of sorts, but as an active fighter, did not provide the best platform to have his attention solely on elevating his team. So a year and a half prior to the team, TJ Burrell fight, they hired Dwayne Ludwig, a man who quickly and effectively improved the entire team's striking. Started was that Uriah just texted me one night and said, Dwayne's a steering number. I said, yeah, we talked that night. He brought me out, my wife and I out for a seminar, mapped out Sacramento, and then uh, we started coaching the guys. You know, I'm getting way more credit than I think I deserve. I don't actually do that much. I just give them ideas and these you know, athletes just running with it. So it's going good, man. I'm definitely happy. I'm much happier now outside the cage than I was inside the cage. Legend in our sport, in my opinion. He's a guy that's won kickboxing world championship. The fact that we got a guy like Dwayne Ludwig, who I just feel was really the missing link to Team Alpha Male. Uh, he's just brought a little bit of organization. We've always been a good team. We've been here supporting each other, coaching each other. But it's hard having fighters coaching fighters. Team Alpha Male fighters have gone undefeated in 10 UFC fights. It's one thing for us to say, oh, we're feeling better. It's awesome to have a coach, but I think the results are showing it also. We all look a lot cleaner. It was the perfect storm, and riding an undefeated year working with Dwayne, Team Alpha Male looked unstoppable. The team in all the post-fight interviews had nothing but admiration and gratitude for his coaching. But as with all things, what looks like a perfect story on the surface lies underneath a more disturbing reality. A couple months before 
TJ would claim the title of bantamweight champion, Uriah would advertise the spot for a new head coach at the gym. It would transpire that Dwayne, not happy with his paycheck, would be taking his expertise to Colorado in order to build his own team from the ground up. In what should have been a fairly simple split and departure for both sides, an amical parting of ways got caught by the media, who in all their twisting and prodding managed to dredge up truths and pains that otherwise should have been left out of the public domain. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm doing good. Like, uh, at first, it, things, things were rough, for sure, like 100%. They weren't, they weren't easy for me out here. And then I uh, made some, some decisions, some changes, and, and the team ended up, you know, we, had, we renegotiated our deals. It was a little bit different than what I thought it was. So we renegotiated in August, and uh, the guys have been taking care of me. It's, it's, not, it's not for money. Um, although, like, I don't make a lot of money in, in any one thing. Like, I don't make a lot of money from the team. But I make, you know, I make, I do okay from the team. I do okay for my business. I do okay for my seminars, my other things. So together, I do good. Yeah, Dwayne, Dwayne's did a great job running his practice, and he and he was passionate about his his stuff. You know, we implemented a lot of his uh, his drills during our set practices, and and it uh, it, it turned out great. But uh, he was a little difficult to deal with here and there, and so actually, it's kind of a breath of fresh air to. Have part ways. In what might seem like parting words of a fairly innocuous and seemingly numerous situation in the world of MMA were actually the foundations of a rift to come that would split the gyms in half. In those words from both parties were buried bitterness and resentment that would soon be uncovered. But for the meantime, the story faded into distant memory. July 2015 rolls around and arguably the catalyst for this whole feud sparks. Dwayne Ludwig would take to Sirius XM and claim that TJ was the only fighter on Team Alpha Male roster who wanted to win a title, and the fighter who trained the hardest. He also heavily implied that had Chad Mendes done his camp in Colorado, he would have beaten Jose Aldo and would be the reigning featherweight champion. It of course sparked a response out of the alpha male entourage who took to Twitter to cast down Dwayne's aspersions. In response, Dwayne would ultimately apologise, but not back down on the fact that fighters would be better off training with him at his camp. Well, you said on SiriusXM that TJ is the only member of Team Alpha Male that really wants to be a champion. Do you regret saying these comments? You know. I don't regret it because ultimately, if you want something, you're going to figure out a way to make it happen. No one trains as intense or as focused as TJ, period. I mean, there's champions and then there's champions. TJ wants to be the best in the world. Not the best of another organization, but the best fighter in the world. But Chad could be wearing the belt right now. There's just a couple things that he needs to fix and he could be wearing the belt right now. But this interview just served to open the floodgates and now everyone descended into taking shots at each other amidst the fight week of TJ's second matchup against Burrell. Dwayne. <laughs> like half-heartedly, delusionally tried to sue the team. I said, you know, dysfunction follows the guy and the guy's a bully. And Dwayne is getting like free peanut butter, you know? And so, you know, which he starts selling peanut butter at the front desk at our gym, right? The blatant, like, ex-girlfriend mentality, like crazy ex-girlfriend of like, trying to break the team down is just bizarre to me. I don't get it. You know, Dwayne's not part of Team Alpha Male. You know, this is a team that I'm gonna be a part of so I'm completely done fighting and probably uh, after, you know, I owe everything to Team Alpha Mel. And Dwayne was a small, tiny little part of that. And, uh, you know, I just hate that so many people are assuming that Dwayne completely made our team. Just tired of hearing it. Well, yeah. you, you were there when everybody was a big, happy family. And yeah. then Dwayne Ludwig came in and... He messed it all up. Comfortable because he makes some racist jokes sometimes. You know, he a couple of fighters that were black. No, there's some Latino, jokes. A bit of a strange scenario this week with you know your coach Bang Ludwig talking. How big of a distraction has that been? Uh, not at all for me. I mean, for one, I know it's taken out of text a little bit. Um, you know, with him, it's just that he believes he's the best. You know, just like I believe I'm the best, and uh, he thinks that people should be working with him, with him if they yeah, they have, if they have the opportunity. You know, and they're just in, in his eyes, they're not doing so. So I mean, it's just different personalities. You know, I mean. I'm using him. He's, he's the best coach in the world in my eyes. You know, I mean, I got the best team at home, and so I gotta I gotta juggle both things, but uh, also not choose sides. You know. 
And I guess that's what characterised this whole spectacle. TJ was stuck in the middle between his friends and family back at Team Alpha Male and the coach that he believed would propel him to be the best fighter in the world in Dwayne Ludwig and Bang Muay Thai in Colorado. TJ simply wanted to be better, but loyalty, ego and money wedged their way in. And despite what was best for the athletes, animosity took the forefront. For the second Burrell fight, he had split his camp between both Sacramento and Colorado. It was a choice that would ultimately pay off in the short term. He would once again destroy Burrell, putting aside any thoughts that he was lucky in their first outing. But long term, the damage was done, and a few short months later, one man would put the final nail in the coffin of TJ's time at Team Alpha Male. As TJ's here with us. Here with us. He ain't with you. A little snake in the grass he is. He's a little snake in the grass. For Connor to like act like he knows what our situation is is bizarre. Where's the little weasel? Has he got Dwayne with him? Him and Dwayne, come over, take the show, take over the show. <laughs> people who are disloyal, people who bite the hand that feeds them. I cannot relate to that in any way, shape, or form. Ah, there's a little snake in the grass right there. What's up, hey, little boy. How's it going? Are you lost? Yeah. Congratulate you and your you and your coach, Dwayne. Oh. Great win, man. Well done. Appreciate it. The right thing's Dwayne's a snake, though. About TJ without saying something, cuz. Boy, that's loyalty. What, you gonna do something about it? What are you gonna do? I'll do something about it. Do something then. Do something then, you. Do something then, you. Feel in what was a surprise to everyone besides McGregor, TJ would announce his departure from the team just a few weeks after the airing of the show, choosing instead to train full-time with Dwayne Ludwig in Colorado. It would further cement McGregor's cleric ability in memes and YouTube videos for predicting the eventual fallout between both parties. But to everyone who was truly paying attention, the inevitability of this situation was obvious. The only strange thing is that TJ managed to walk away from the situation branded as a snake in the grass and the villain of the entire situation. For him though, he had made what he thought was the right choice, choosing his career and himself before loyalty to a singular team. Faber would also fairly quickly close the door to the student he pulled from college, ending TJ's chapter at Team Alpha Male. Hey, let's get my boy TJ Dillashaw in here to take care of my dirty work now, Hanan Burrell. Because he's a snake in the grass, and I told you that for your face. You brought him onto the, uh, into the tough thinking he was there to help you, and he was there to help him. He's a snake in the grass, and you, and you, you need to figure that out and stop being a The cracks that tough and the subsequent departure of TJ split open were about to widen as it was announced Dillashaw would be defending his title against the consensus bantamweight GOAT. Dominic Cruz, who was making his comeback after two years sidelined due to injuries. Dominic had a long history with Team Alpha Male and was more than willing to rub salt into the wounds of the fractured camp. Guys that wanted to be Alpha Males, there can only be one. TJ said it himself that in his mind he's been beating up Faber for years. And then you got Ludwig also in the mix for a second where Ludwig wants to be the coach. He wants to be the guy who invented TJ Dillshaw. He wants to be the guy who invents all these guys at Alpha Male, makes them better. Well, Faber wants to be that guy too. There can only be one yet again. So it was a matter of time before that whole thing fell apart because they're just a bunch of meatheads trapped in one room. During his time sidelined, he had been performing as one of the best analysts in the game. He was concise and fast with his vocabulary, and that meant when it came to trash talk, most people seemed like they were NPCs with him in the driving seat of the narrative. TJ was no exception. He hasn't faced somebody like me. He's able to mix things up because he's facing stationary targets. So he's been able to look a lot better than he really is. I'm gonna beat you because I'm better than you. I, nobody even hits me. I mean, I'm done talking to you. You can't be done talking to me. You're right here facing me, <laughs> dummy. I'm you gotta talk to me. You have no choice. You got nowhere to go. Keep talking. The fissures were being exposed by Cruz one minute detail at a time. And as he fanned the flames, Uriah saw the opportunity to wedge himself in and get a title shot over whoever the winner was. Dude, we're friends if you want to be friends. All right. Is Zufa going to let us not fight each other? I, I think that's probably not going to happen. The build up to this fight proved that Team Alpha Male had truly left TJ behind and both sides were willing to exchange barbs in order to discredit the other. I didn't, I didn't ever suspect Uriah acting the way he's acted, very childish, you know? Trying to talk as much trash on me as possible, almost bringing his name into the limelight by talking trash about me. 
much to the amusement of Dominic, who continued to stoke the fire. I think you're scared of Doshaw because you <laughs> lose to your grandson. He was telling me about how he used to work you and you're like a dinosaur. Regardless of the rift, TJ remained focused on the task at hand and was ready to end the legacy of Team Alpha Male's walking kryptonite. Dominic may have been absent from the fight game, but his performance proved that time under the bright lights does not determine success. Ring rust, merely a subjective anchor chained to the mentality of fighters more willing to romance with excuses over fact. Cruz was building an inspiring story of his own, of which TJ was relegated to a footnote. 49, 46 for the winner by split decision and new UFC undisputed A competitive razor close split decision would go in favour of the former bantamweight champion in what would be one of the greatest comeback stories the sport would ever know. It is one of those times the sport reminds us that at the heart of it lies a ruthless and merciless honesty, a binary truth. You either win or you lose, ones and zeros that transcribe to a remorseless reality. TJ was left in disbelief at the decision, but a close fight is often forgotten by the short-lived memory of fans, and by the time the ink dries on the history books, it reads as a loss. In fairness to Dillashaw, the judges, the media, and the fans did not have a consensus decision. No one truly could agree on who won that fight, but the scorecard read the same, with the dominator on top of the division. TJ immediately called for the rematch, and it seemed like the obvious fight to put together. But the UFC had other plans. Uriah's consistent attempts at placing himself in the discussion for a fight with either Dominic or Dillashaw had paid off, and the rubber match between himself and Cruz made the most monetary sense in terms of pay-per-view sales. Dominic had made a living off of beating Team Alpha Male's fighters, and the matchup proved to be no exception. Uriah would be thoroughly outclassed, and dropped a unanimous decision to the Dominator. Remaining true to form, Uriah would repeat history, placing one one of his students above himself in defeat, this time Cody Garbrandt, who was rising through the division. Like I said, Cody, no love. You guys saw him tonight. The guy's ready for a strap, I know that. To cap off the night, Dominic would not shy away from subverting Uriah's goodwill, exposing the more likely business self-intent that perhaps lit at the heart of Alpha Male's camp. Uriah mentioned Cody Garbrandt. You obviously watch everyone in the division and a lot of fighters. Is that someone you're looking at? But I think that that's somebody that Faber manages and collects a percentage off of. And if you sit back and consider what Dominic is saying, it gives life to a new perspective to the self-interest that mayhaps motivate Uriah. One event later, and the man left behind in the wake of the UFC's ruthless business practice would claim back a loss on his record by dispatching a Sun Tao in a dominant performance at UFC 200. In his mind, he should never have fought to restate his position in the division, and felt that he was being unfairly treated. Regardless, with a win over the number three ranked in the division, he felt that he had now rightfully secured his rematch against the champion. I should already fought for the title. I want my, I want my belt back. I feel like it's rightfully mine anyways. I feel like I won that fight, so uh, I think I'm ready for it now. But there was one person TJ wasn't expecting, Cody Garbrandt. <laughs> UFC 202 would chuck a spanner in the works in the form of Cody Garbrandt, who had been notching wins into his undefeated record and had quite perfectly timed himself a backstage drama with Cruz. Coupling this with his dominant and decisive win later in the night over top 10 Mizugaki was enough for Dana White to sign off on a match between the two. To add insult to injury, TJ would have to once again fight for his chance to contend for the title he lost, this time on the undercard of Cruz and Garbrandt, an insult to a former champion who had surely earned his rematch. Dominic had stayed true to form in embarrassing the tongue-tied Garbrandt all the way to the octagon doors. I never had a chase pussy in my life on December 30th, I ain't doing it. I don't have to. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? We'll see out a bunch of nothing, never had a bunch a of beard. opinions that have no validity behind them. Validity. There's nothing behind that. Nice word, nice word. You don't even know what it means. Spell it. <laughs> but when they shut, the embarrassment would soon backfire. If there was not a physical manifestation for the old adage, eating your own words, then Garbrandt's dismantling of the consensus best bantamweight of all time was clearly a strong contender for it. Cody put on a performance so remarkable it had made him a star overnight, a performance that to this day remains one of the best title performances of all time. Cruz would ultimately turn down a rematch with Cody, finally setting up a long overdue fight. The news dropped announcing a matchup between former teammates, now turned rivals, Garbrandt and 
Dillashaw, but there was a twist. They would helm the 25th season of The Ultimate Fighter, and well, things were about to get nasty. I was given an ultimatum to select where I wanted to train. I was training at Team Alpha Male, and I would travel to uh, Dwayne Ludwig's gym to do my camps. Dwayne Ludwig and Uriah didn't see it. I, Uriah gave me an ultimatum. You know, he told me I can either choose Team Alpha Male or I can choose Dwayne Ludwig. And as soon as someone gives you an ultimatum, you know that guy doesn't have your back. But as time went on, I got to know TJ as a person. It wasn't the case. It was just that he's a dickhead. I'm so scared. Oh, so scared. It was no surprise that this was the direction that the UFC wanted to go in. Over the last few years, the split between TJ and Team Alpha Male was a storyline that had been plastered over media and news outlets since the very beginning. For whatever reason, fans and fighters alike had vested interest in the progression of this narrative, and Tuff seemed like the perfect platform to exploit every single person involved in the situation. And true to form, for a bunch of hot-headed Alpha Male fighters, the whole season delivered, just not in the way that you would expect. TJ, with no thanks to Connor, had managed to assume the title of the villain going into the show, and Cody with his emphatic win over Dom was quite literally becoming a star. But the script was about to be flipped. The whole show was a scramble of insults, character assassinations, and slanderous statements from the alpha male camp that were attempting to impale TJ's already diminishing public persona on a spike. But all it did was backfire, miserably. The show was a complete mess. No one walked away looking like the good guy, but what it did do was split public perception on who was actually in the wrong. Fans couldn't agree on anything. Lies, truth and facts blurred into a hazy mirage of testosterone-infused propaganda. Team Alpha Male had spent the better part of three years discrediting TJ, and in a lot of ways to great success, but this show served to walk back everything they ever said, and if the Ultimate Fighter TV show wasn't indicative of the bitterness to follow, then the week leading into their fight certainly delivered in manifesting every ounce of resentment between the two. Team Alpha Male had attempted to undermine and discredit TJ at every point. Bring you how many times did I fuck you up in practice? Zero. Motherfucker. Exactly. We're gonna find yeah, out. Saturday, you're gonna you find out. You can talk all you want, show your insecurity, show who you really are. We're gonna get out there. I'm gonna have Dude, a song I had you in your own I'm locker. gonna break your ass. And so, even after a relentless barrage, they still had another ace up their sleeve that they were waiting to deliver. Uriah and Cody had alluded to multiple times over the years TJ's inclination to cheap shot and be aggressive during practice. But what they were referring to was much darker than a simple punch at the end of a round. TJ was never the best teammate. He would like try to hurt people. He's a very competitive guy and he has a temper and like... Try to hurt people how? At the end of the bell, knees, you know what I mean? That's why Chris is is out, you know what I mean? Need him in the back of the head for yeah, concussions. That's it, yeah. I mean, Chris Holdsworth, that's, that's where the injury came from? I mean, from? I don't want to... Chris doesn't want us really talking about that. Is it true that TJ Dillashaw <clears throat> is responsible for you having to retire? Did he in fact injure you? That instance that's out in the public is, yeah, that's definitely true. Um, And, and just for TJ... Just wanted to ask you about what Chris Holdworth said on, on Monday. It, it's all happened at the perfect time. You know, when it came out, the week of the fight, like, come on, man, this is all super predictable. Predictable. Right. No truth to it? None whatsoever. The news served to vilify Dillashaw in ways that are hard to imagine. His legacy of being a sucker puncher in practice had finally caught up with him, and this fact was hard to ever justify. The fans didn't hold back in their resentment for it either, and during his walk out to the Octagon, he would be showered in chants of fuck TJ and booze. He could not have been perceived any lower in terms of public opinion. The fight to end the feud began, but it did so to the backdrop of one more skeleton Team Alpha Male dragged out of the closet. TJ had denied allegations of being knocked out by Cody in practice, but they had the footage, and after consistent threats to release it, they finally cracked a few days before the fight. Like, there's this is the videotape of uh, Cody knocking out TJ, uh -huh. and uh, TMZ is trying to buy it for me for 50 grand. Oh! Big knockdown for Cody! There's the horn to end round one. Right what in particular um, have they lied about in your eyes? Just everything. Just the way they handle themselves and just... Uh, <laughs> just everything they want to bring up, you know what I mean? It's all mental warfare. It's all things to get. Man, we're tired of hearing this guy's lies. Hey, we don't have to set up every kick. You can just blast a fucking kick if you want, like to your body, right? Not everything has to be a setup. Okay, just blast a fucking kick. Okay. So it's about keeping emotions in line. 
Oh man, my emotions are always in line. You know, it's something I've had. It's something I've had to learn how to control, though. You know, something I have had to do. You know, but that's that's no exactly. He right. had to learn how to control it after he entered his uh, training partners. I'm always learning, brother. I'm always learning. Always getting better. It's hard to empathize with what an athlete on top of this sport experiences, but it's easy to understand the feeling of conquering every demon imaginable on the grandest stage on earth. I think because it went so long, this drama went on for so long that it was easy to kind of get by it. You know, right. it got real old after a while. Sure. You know, at first, yeah, you, you know, there's guys that you call some of your best friends back in the day that you know turn their back on you instantly. So that was a little hurtful in the beginning, but like I said, it got got real old real quick, and it was easy to kind of get past it. Over the last few years of the feud, TJ had managed to put himself in the crosshairs and be the full guy for every single fan and ex-teammate's animosity. And in the face of public scrutiny, he stayed focused and driven. Without that fact, he surely would have faltered against Codley's relentless abuse and venom. But regardless of the palpable acrimony, Dillashaw emerged the other side of the fight as a champion, claiming back the belt he coveted so much, but also seemingly ending the feud with Team Alpha Male. While season 25 of Tough would serve to make the Alpha Male team look confused and directionless in their animosity towards TJ, no one walked away from the saga looking like the good guy. TJ was ousted as an arrogant cheap shotter that put his own teammates' health at risk, and whilst Justin Buckles would walk back some of the facts regarding the knee, it wasn't exactly a good look for TJ. And the whole of Team Alpha Male just looked so pathetic when you considered the whole beef could be boiled down to a crucifixion of TJ for simply changing camps, something fighters do all the time. It was a mindless witch hunt that ultimately destroyed the reputation of everyone involved. Friendships and mentorships were raised to ash, and all for naught but ego and money. For fans, the whole charade served as a mildly entertaining high school drama, with a fist fight at the end of it. The end of the drama fizzled out in what would be the final muffled notes of a messy and scrambled symphony. Cody and TJ would square off again, but in a series of events that serve as a mirror reflecting back at itself, Cody would go out in almost exactly the same way he did the first time. TJ exited the octagon bantamweight champion and was ready to leave the feud behind him. The crimson waves of a setting sun dashed for the final time on one of the most storied sets of events the sport will ever know. The screen fades to black and the curtains draw. The shit talk and mm -hmm. the TV show, them accusing me of everything, like, yeah. that, that took a lot, you know? And so for all that to be, like, taken off my shoulders feels great. You seem like such nice, friendly guys yeah. away from everything. We have our moments of, of being nice, but we also have our very uh, brutal moments. And it's at, a, at your best friend's expenses, so um, it's, it makes it interesting and it keeps you humble. Like I said from the beginning, there's no animosity on my side, you know, obviously, uh, it gets old, all the all the all the trash talk and all the bullshit and the guys you thought were friends. It does get old, but I, I, I said from the beginning there wasn't any animosity on my side. You know, I wasn't holding anything. It's a lot harder to fight with all that shit. On your shoulders. In the background of all of this, Dana White had been setting his sights on ending the division below Dillashaw's. You know, we'll, we'll see how this thing plays out, but th there's guys. Even if it goes away, guys like Benavides and guys like that could move up a weight class too. Do you think they'd be uh, be higher, bigger interest with Demetrius, with such a you know a great champion? Yeah, you and would think so. You would think so, but it never happened. They never pulled ratings. They never pulled pay per views. It just it, it wasn't. You know. Demetrius Johnson had landed himself in a precarious position. He was easily the most dominant champ in the promotion's history, even breaking Anderson Silva's record with 11 title defences. But the problem was, despite skill, talent and the mastery of the art of eight limbs, DJ had every single factor playing against him. He was small, he didn't trash talk, he devoted himself completely to training and being a father, and he was a gamer. This vital set of ingredients created a champion that the wider MMA community disregarded. He has the lowest selling pay-per-view in the history of the UFC in the modern era. And so the UFC never promoted him or attempted to make him a star. The UFC had toiled with the notion of sending a challenger down a weight class to engage audiences again, a proven star with a modest draw, TJ Dillashaw. A fight between him and TJ Dillashaw would be something that people would actually be interested in. 
who wouldn't want to see Demetrius Johnson versus TJ Dillashaw? Dillashaw calling me every day. I'm, I'm cutting weight, I'm cutting weight, I'm dieting, I'm training, I'm cutting weight. TJ wanted the fight desperately. He wanted to ascend to the heights and prestige of double champ to solidify his legacy. But Johnson wasn't having any of it. He absolutely refuses to fight the guy. Quite to the detriment of his already tarnished reputation at the company, the UFC were at a standstill with their stubborn and dominant champion, and so settled on sending in Henry Cejudo, a challenger who had already lost to DJ. But perhaps this time he could shake up the division and usurp the pay-per-view vacuum. Cejudo would topple the giant, but only in a razor-close split decision. His post-fight interview showed shimmers of potential popularity. He was charismatic and addressed the elephant in the room, pleading with Dana White to give him the opportunity to make a super fight and restore some semblance of popularity to the flyweight division. I felt disrespected this whole time, you know, and America is all about winners, Joe. I want to fight the winner 135 pounds. I deserve it! Olympic champion, now UFC champion. Henry's call out would be answered later on that same night after TJ had reigned victorious over Cody. Henry Cejudo won the flyweight title before this fight and said that he wants to come up and fight you at 135 pounds. I think that would be a fantastic fight. Bring it baby, let's do this. The UFC held back on their proposition to vanquish the flyweights and DJ's career would ultimately turn down a path that is both surprising and inspiring. Demetrius Johnson appears to be headed to one and Ben Askren appears to be headed to the UFC. And if you'd like to learn more about that, then I highly recommend Patrick Gavia's video on the matter. Cejudo wouldn't wait around and accept the same fate as DJ and quickly brought hype to a potential matchup between himself and TJ. Fire will run right through you. No, I'm a different fire than you know that. I, I can tell you respect me. Yeah, I got respect for you. I can tell you. Let me go you. medalist. I, can I can't wait to you. take that too. I'll take it off you. <laughs> the brass loved it. And so they put together the fight every fan wanted to see. The question was, could TJ make the wait? TJ's obsession with being the best, it's a trait so interlaced with those that are champions, a trait that is both a blessing and a curse. His single-minded devotion to breaking records and doing what no one else had ever done was enough to drag him through the gruelling workouts, the cut and the relentless fight camp. The problem is, no matter how mentally resilient an individual can be, sometimes the body gives up well before the mind. And I pushed my body to the extreme, you know, about six weeks out, uh, my body started to crash, it started to get tired, I started feeling, feeling that I didn't want to wake up for practice. TJ was already a lean 135 pounder, often making a 20 pound cut from his walk around weight, but those extra 10 pounds to cut were simply a toll TJ's body couldn't afford to make. His body, crushed and defeated, began to shut down. He was tired, lethargic and lacked any energy. And I started crashing and I, I tested my hematocrit. Um, I was down in the 30s, which I normally walk around like a four That's to five, low. you yeah. know, very low. Um, and so I was down in the 30s, high 30s, but you know, on the verge of coming, becoming anemic. His body was done, but was there something he could take to fix this? Um, I decided to take something I knew I wasn't allowed to take. Uh, it's called Procrit. It is a um, anemia medication that would you know, help me not only make the weight, but be myself. EPO is a well-known doping drug in many sports. It stimulates the production of red blood cells, which carry oxygen to the muscles. And when you become uh, anemic, you, your red blood cells start to plummet, you lose energy. You know, you're like, oh, I heard somebody's doing this, I heard somebody's doing that, and should we think about that? Lance, all you need is the red cells. And did you feel better after taking it? Did you, did you sense that it worked? Oh yeah, man, I was coming back to normal. Like, I didn't mind waking up in the morning and having to hit a run. I mean, I was running five days a week to make the weight on a certain diet, do base, um, having to become a, a triathlete. Um, so yeah, I mean, I needed the energy to, to be able to even push to that. I'm not mad I did it because I don't think I could have taken the fight. TJ had sold his soul to the devil in pursuit of greatness. Now scattered amidst the lies and deceit, all he had was to train, and train he did.
don't care. Uh, I'm on a mission to get it. Gonna question you with us, you wizard, you wizard. I'm in a push in the limits. Better finish the race. Who's watching the minutes? Sharp as a razor with it. Feeling a rage, you know what it takes to win it. I wanna pay for giving. I had a razor filler, just made your business. Uh, so I'm stopping at nothing. You see me, it's not a discussion. I'm dumping and dumping. Had to stop the percussion. It's scary, but stop with the pumpkins. I've had enough of the lunch. Just sitting with all the suits corrupted. Telling me you're like a bee, I erupted. Trying to stop this. Now nah, watch this. It was getting really cold too when you start putting food and fluids back in your system because all the blood goes to your stomach. And I got no body fat. Ah, so you, you know, all of us say, man, how do we know TJ is going to be 100% on fight night? I mean, is that a fair question? Like, if you're from the outside looking in, do you understand why people are, are worried that you're not going to be TJ Dillashaw? That's why, that's why this fight's exciting, right? That's why everyone wants to talk about it. It's like, that gives a little X factor. But um, as you can tell now, man, I'm close right now and I got no problem. 124.6. So Hudo and his team made a big deal about TJ missing the weight, but he absolutely breezed it. Made it look easy. These guys can't wait to get at one another. Your expectations for tomorrow night, my man? Man, I'm excited. I feel so freaking good. I mean, I feel good at weigh-ins too, you know, being on weight. Uh, quite surprised, actually. You deserve the opportunity. All the best tomorrow night. TJ Dillashaw, folks. of some dark and lonely doom, TJ's ego was crucified on a devastating loss. But that sinister lie creeping in the shadows was about to come to light. I had my manager call me and say, hey man, I just got a call from uh, the UFC. TJ Dillashaw tested positive for injectable EPO. TJ Dillashaw just got suspended by USADA for a year. But that is bad. That is very, very bad for him. It has a major detriment on professional ambition. This guy's a little dirty, man. That's, it, it's not good for our sport. During this time, he he's beat, he's not only beat, but knocked out Cody Garbrandt. They gotta go back and test his old samples, because like Cody, Cody has a legitimate fucking gripe. Maybe that slight edge was because he's a fucking cheater. It's downright disgusting. I mean, you know, I mean, for his legacy, it's it's oh, it's oh, it's what legacy? Yeah, what fucking legacy? In his first public announcement regarding the positive test, TJ relinquishes the belt, and he notes this is specifically due to the respect he has for his division. But how can you talk about respect when you actively cheated in a sport that puts the competitors' health at risk each and every time they step into the octagon? There is no respect when the advantage you gain is in increased power, increased speed, and increased endurance. All specific attributes that quite literally make you more deadly. There is nothing more egregious in combat sports than placing your own ego above the health and safety of your peers. It's not a question of whether TJ can recover from this. His legacy was lit aflame the moment he took a step down this path. And as the history books are raised to ash and dust, there is no space for excuses or reason. TJ deliberately corrupted a game to eschew a level playing field. But the problem is, when you attempt to manipulate the universe, it always bites back. TJ couldn't escape fate, and no matter how hard you try, the world will always catch up with your transgressions one way or another. And regardless of whether he did or didn't cheat previously to the Shahudo fight does not matter because the court of public opinion had already executed his legacy. Chris Holdsworth said that the truth would out in the end and I guess we should have taken him at his word. TJ was now branded and marked and sanctioned from the sport, leaving time to slowly forget his place in the division he ruled over.
two years is just too far out. No. And uh, so I'm happy I mean, to you, hear that. Do you like a comeback story? I love a comeback story. Who doesn't story? like a good comeback story? Who doesn't story, love right? a good comeback story? You know, love me or hate me, sure. this is going to be a great comeback well, story. Well, and you're so. such a nice guy, but you are public enemy number one. Oh, when you course. come back, you'll Why have you think three, I'm dressed four, in all five. Black? And believe me, you're going to have three <laughs> or four or five guys saying, come on in, yes. man. We've been waiting for you. Good. Time pressed on and the shadow TJ cast over the division slowly faded, leaving new champions to rise amidst his broken legacy. Two years is a long time for any person to reflect on their failures, shortcomings and deceit. But the fact is, everyone is deserving of redemption of a chance to course correct and to prove that they can move past their blemishes. We are all capable of falling short of proper moral functioning. We are all deeply flawed, subject to the pushes and pulls of life that drag us down paths we seldom wish our deepest enemies to commit to. We are ultimately not perfect, and to cast dispersions on a person we know little on, beyond his PED violations, seems so empty. TJ had a responsibility to be better do better, and be a leader amongst his peers, fans and family. That was his duty as champion. Yes, he did fail at it, but would we have fallen victim to the same weaknesses so present in TJ? It's not a question you can answer. We are not privy to the minutiae of his life. We are not present in his thought stream. We have no idea what pushed him to fail so miserably. But if you claim to be so free of sin, then you are simply a liar. Yes, we can feel let down or betrayed by him, but to be so insulting, insensitive, and to hold it against him for the rest of his career, to me just lacks any modicum of empathy. TJ lost more than we can truly appreciate. He lost his legacy. Every single fight he ever fought and won, destroyed in an instant. He lost his teammates respect, and ultimately he lost some of the best years of his career. He lost the championship and the monetary value that comes with it. A punishment deserved, but more importantly, one that was served. He did his time, and for it, TJ earned to come back. The UFC, who also lost face in the wake of TJ's PED abuse, were not about to give him an easy ride back to the title either. His return matchup was against a former teammate and a man many feared in the division. He did the crime and he did the time. And that's just, I mean, you can't ask for anything more. Two years is a long time, man. If it wasn't obvious, there was no way TJ was going to escape the questions and constant prodding of the media. Almost every question was aimed at his cheating, a fact enough to wear anyone down. But TJ seemed to have just accepted this as par for the course and seemed more concerned with just moving past it. I just wonder, I mean, like your reputation and all this happening, I mean, are you hoping to, to rehab that at all or are people to leave that behind or, or have you just kind of turned on the world and say, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not worried about it anymore? I mean, excuse my language, but fuck your reputation, you know what I mean? I mean, you gotta worry about yourself. I have a great life, I have a great family. Um, I'm just worried about my, my, my coaches, my uh, teammates, my family. Other than that, I could care less, you know? You can't be, I've been in this game too long to want to scroll through the comments and think what other people fucking think that are sitting behind their computers and not having anything to achieve for, you know? You know, man up, man up to your mistakes, you know? I mean, everyone's got skeletons in their closets, everyone makes mistakes. I feel like it's how you handle it and how you bounce, bounce back from it really, really show your true character. Um, and if you're someone that says you've never made a mistake, I don't, I don't fucking trust you anyways, because like, everyone has, you know what I mean? Um, and I, now it's just me being able to, uh, to uh, save face and do whatever I possibly can and, and apologize and, and work my ass off. I mean, I know that there's no one in this, in this game that will work harder than me. Um, I've proven that, and I will, I will come back and I will be back on top. And that is 47 the guarantee. for the winner by split decision. TJ Dillashaw! TJ may have walked away with a razor close split decision, but if karma wasn't cruel enough, he did so without his knees. Another setback lay in wait for him, as it was an injury that would keep him sidelined for at least another year. That is fate in all its mysticism, reminding TJ that there is never an easy escape from the bitter honesty that the universe provides. Whatever the world has in store for TJ beyond this point, I hope and I believe that he will stand for so much more at the end of his career than being a cheat. And I feel that we as fans should provide him the platform to do so. It's strange to look back at TJ's career and analyze how he found himself at the center of dramas and conflicts that define divisions. It makes for such beautiful and poetic storytelling and we can walk away with many lessons to be learned. We live in a world where trash talk pulls at the seams of the truth and undercutting opponents with deceit and treachery are rewarded with clicks and popularity. Whilst Cody, Uriah and the rest of 
Team Alpha Male may have been haphazard when handling the truth, TJ remained cool and collected and handled himself with care and diligence, emerging the other side of the rivalry with Cody and Team Alpha Male, all the better for it. When the battle cries faded from the bowels of Team Alpha Male's gym, the fighters and trainers started parting ways with one another, and the true extent of TJ's transgressions behind the gym's door were revealed. The head coach of Team Alpha Male revealed that Holdsworth receiving that knee wasn't exactly the reason that he retired professionally, and Cody walked back a lot of the resentment that he held over TJ, Cody even leaving Team Alpha Male himself. The fact is though, if you can put cheap shotting, egotistical tendencies and arrogance down to the personality required to be the best in the world, it is simply impossible to ever justify an athlete who sells his soul to the devil in order to win. Especially when we are dealing with a sport that can, and has killed people, it leaves them with dementia, slurred speech and injuries to plague the second half of their lives. To add an unfair advantage to your power, speed and ferocity, you willingly endanger your peers' lives, and that is truly disturbing. But TJ's life beyond getting caught has taught us that we can and will never get away with deception. Something will always correct the natural flow of life. TJ now has to live with that fact, but to be honest, I'm not sure he cares what you or I think. The man is more concerned with one thing and one thing only, and that is being the best, not only for himself, but his family also. It's never too late to rewrite your story. I care about what my three and a half year old son is going to see when he rewatches my fights, how he's going to see my story and how I dealt with adversity.